Okay, we're on. All right, everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Ted Young. Uh, I work on the Open Tracing Project. Uh, and this is supposedly a, a deep dive into open tracing. And what that means to me is that we're going to get all of your questions answered. So first of all, I want to figure out where people are kind of at in the audience as far as all of this stuff. So we're going to do sort of a series of hand raises. So get your hand ready. First of all, uh, easy one. Who here writes code? OK, good. Get the right audience for this. Uh, who here uh, has uh, used open tracing? OK, good. Good mix. Who here writes uh, open source libraries? Written a library, something? All right, good mix of people. Uh, who here has uh, wanted to pump out some kind of logging or other diagnostic information from the open source library that they wrote? Got some hands. Who here found that to be like really frustrating? <laughs> it's really hard, right? Like, how are you supposed to do it? There's a bunch of questions you need answered, and you can't seem to pick the right thing. Uh, so, uh, oh, and final question: Who here saw uh, Ben's talk about open tracing uh, earlier on Monday? Okay, good. Not too many, so we can do a bit of uh, repeat. So, what I would like to do uh, with this talk is sort of I have a bunch of slides, but we're gonna sort of very quickly uh, run through them. Uh, just to give people a baseline, but then we're going to really turn this into a question and answer session because to me a deep dive is really about an opportunity to ask whatever burning question you have because whatever question you have is probably similar to questions that other people have and I would like to spend most of this half hour really kind of discussing those things. So uh, I'm going to run through the slides real quick. Uh, so don't necessarily expect to keep up and think about questions you want to ask, and then we're going to start passing the microphone around. And in addition to me, we've also got Ben Siegelman here, uh, who started the Open Tracing Project. We have uh, Carlos Alberto, uh, who works on the Python and Java APIs, so uh, we can really get into some detailed Q&A. So real quick, what is distributed tracing? Well, distributed tracing is just monitoring. It's, there's, there's nothing different, there's nothing new. All it is is monitoring, right? Computers are doing things. We want to know what they're doing. Uh, and uh, that's really hard uh, to observe from the outside. So you need to get on the inside. Um, you're, you're never doing anything more than this, I would argue, when you're monitoring. Uh, there's a sequence of events that you're trying to put together. You're trying to analyze those events in aggregate, which is basically metrics. And then you want to set alerts and SLAs and, and other things based on those uh, aggregated events. Uh, so where tracing comes into this picture is uh, that used to be really easy when everything was running on one computer, right? Like this computer starts to heat up. I just pop open activity monitor and find out the thing that's going wrong uh, and restart it. Damn you, Photoshop. Uh, but once everything gets distributed, uh, trying to understand the sequence of events in any particular transaction uh, becomes harder because you know, you've got some logs on this machine, some logs on this other machine, some logs on a third machine, and those logs are all mixed in together with other logs coming out of those machines. And so you start having to do a lot of gluing and filtering just to even get the story put back together again. And once you're gluing, you're tracing. That's, that's basically all tracing is, is passing some form of correlation IDs or some kind of context so that you can actually index these logs and uh, analyze them in a more structured fashion. Because the old fashioned way of just SSHing into the machine and looking at the log files and digging around in there in regex just doesn't work at scale. Uh, if you haven't used a tracing system before, this is tends to be the kind of uh, display that you'll see at first. So uh, audience is left. Uh, you've got a sort of standard looking uh, architecture. Let's imagine uh, this is a sort of web checkout uh, transaction that we want to look at. So you've got a web client. You've got uh, a web server. And that web server is talking to three backends, an authentication service, a billing service, and a database. And so when the user on the client hits uh, purchase, uh, that request goes to the web server. The web server first authorizes you. It then goes to the billing system. Inside the billing system, you've got two steps, verifying, say, your address, and then processing the payment. And when that succeeds, 
uh, you record uh, the transaction in your database. So this kind of visualization uh, on the right uh, shows you uh, some interesting things, right? You can see the latency, how long things took, and you can see uh, concurrency and parallelism. So you can see this is a very serialized uh, set of transactions. We authenticate, we bill, and then we go to the database. Um, so, but once we start talking about uh, tracing and gluing things together, uh, there's a little bit of lingo uh, that we wanna share so we all understand we're talking about the same thing. Uh, so this is another view. If you look at this view here, this uh, graph on the top uh, is uh, the same kind of thing. You've got uh, service A making a network call to service B, and inside of service A, there's a, a set of operations that are occurring uh, that are related to each other. So uh, each operation uh, in tracing lingo, we tend to call a span. So a span is just something your computer did that has a name, it has a start time, it has a duration or an end time, and then it has a bunch of tags that are attached to it. And you can think of these tags as basically indices that you're going to use uh, in your database later in order to uh, look up these transactions or aggregate them into metrics. Uh, in order to then glue these things together, there's some bit of information that has to go in band over the wire. So when service A talks to service B, let's say you're making an HTTP call, you need to have an HTTP header in there where you're passing along at minimum some kind of identifier. And there's usually two. There's a trace identifier that says, hey, this is the whole overall transaction. And then you have a parent span identifier. So when the next operation occurs in service B, it needs to know the previous operation was this particular one from service A. And that's uh, there's often maybe some other information that you're sending over the wire as well, but that's kind of the primary thing that's going on there. Um, there's a lot of confusion because there's a lot of different projects. They kind of partially overlap. There's not a huge amount of standardization in this space yet, but that's the thing we're trying to work towards. Um, uh, another reason why there's some amount of confusion is depending on who you are in this ecosystem, you may care about one aspect of the standardization, sorry, uh, over, over the other one. Uh, and so because people might care about one part of this more than they care about another part of it, you know, uh, sometimes these conversations can kind of move past each other. So uh, part of this talk and uh, this deep dive is to really get people on the same page about what these different pieces are. Uh, so if we dig into those pieces, this right here, this is your system from the perspective of a monitoring system. Uh, in cloud computing, it really doesn't get much more complicated than this, even though it might look complicated because you have a big system. At the end of the day, you have your services that you're running. Uh, your services, for the most part, are probably made up of your application code and your application logic, uh, but then you're leveraging a whole bunch of shared libraries. Right, so, uh, and in particular, things like frameworks and RPC calls, uh, that's shared code that you're not writing yourself. You don't say, okay, I'm going to write, uh, you know, a new e-commerce application, so step one, let's re-implement HTTP, right? You're just gonna go grab an HTTP library. Um, but then you're gonna wanna log a bunch of information, and you're gonna send some of this context over the wire. And so that bit where you're sending the context over the wire, that's pretty related to that HTTP library that you're using. Because at the end of the day, that library should be the thing that's injecting and extracting this span context uh, and propagating that down the, uh, down the wire. So in addition to your services, you're also talking to other people's services. So you're not just leveraging shared libraries, you're also leveraging shared services running on shared infrastructure. And as soon as you do that, those things are kind of like black boxes. Uh, you can see like inside your service, you can install some kind of tracing API uh, or a tracing system and pump data out into some kind of analysis system. But you can't do that with other people's services. But increasingly, they're all providing some form of tracing analysis. You know, you've got X-Ray and Stackdriver and all these other things. Uh, so if you want to get a complete trace of everything that includes not just your application code and your services, but also maybe include some details about how they're interacting with these databases and things that other people are running. 
there's some bit on the back end where you're going to end up with potentially multiple different analysis systems. And if you want to get a complete trace, you're going to have to take part of that tracing data out of one of these systems and pump it into another one. Um, I would say for a lot of application developers, you're probably not needing to do too much of that yet, uh, especially if you're not really pushing the boundaries of the services that you're using. But more and more uh, people are, are building bigger systems that, that really are pushing those boundaries. And so that's a problem that's going to need to get solved more and more in the future. So again, this is just another slide saying basically what I just said. Um, so in order to make that whole system work, you're going to need uh, four pieces. And three of them ideally should be standardized or, or shared in some way. Uh, if you have a tracing API that's standardized, then you can put it into your libraries that then get shared with other people, right? Because you're not making a decision for them about whether they're using Jaeger or Zipkin or some other system. Uh, you can't, you wouldn't want to say put like, you know, a new relic API or something, you know, vendor or proprietary into your open source library. But someone who's using your open source library may want to pump information out into one of those systems. So some kind of API that kind of ab abstracts that problem would be very useful. Uh, in terms of sending data over the wire, uh, ideally that would be standardized as well. So you have some standard HTTP headers that you're putting this uh, trace state into. Um, because then things like proxies and uh, when you have these systems linking to each other, they're able to kind of recognize that, oh, this is trace state, uh, there's tracing going on. Uh, and then ideally, uh, if we're going to have to export data from one of these systems to another, uh, or uh, write services that just want to expose some kind of endpoint like syslog, uh, it would be great to have some kind of standard data format uh, that that information was coming out in, rather than having to like write adapters for all of these different data formats that are out there. And then last but not least, you have some kind of system that you're analyzing this data in. I would argue that's the place where you don't need standardization, because everyone's just running their own system. And that's also the place where we're trying to sort of move uh, monitoring forward and coming up with better and better ways of analyzing this data. So what I, I would argue that really what you want is the part where you're getting the data out of the system, we should all agree on kind of what that looks like and have some standards there. Uh, and then really focus in terms of, you know, competing with each other and, and trying to push the boundaries just, just in the analysis part uh, that's not happening inside of these systems. Um, when you go to instrument your own application code though, I would say you're going to hear people say, oh, you really got to use this, you really got to use that, you have to use open tracing, you have to use census, you have to use something or other. I don't think you have to use anything when it's just your application code. You can kind of do whatever you want. That's your code. Uh, you're not sharing it with anybody else. Uh, it's sort of like you're in your bedroom with blinds closed. Like, whatever you want to do to get data out of there is fine. But uh, a very common thing is, like, what happens when you want to take some of your application code pull it out as some kind of shared library and let other people use it. Or even internally uh, within your own application, run it in a bunch of different contexts. Uh, so as soon as you do that, you're talking about instrumenting shared libraries. And as soon as you want to instrument shared libraries, uh, you run right into this problem of not wanting to make a bunch of these decisions. So you need some kind of abstracted API uh, in order to help uh, uh, be able to actually bake instrumentation directly into your library rather than people writing a bunch of plugins uh, and adapters for each kind of tracing or monitoring system you might want to attach. Uh, shared services, that's a black box, uh, so you can't have any kind of API level thing, so the standardization for shared services has to happen at the protocol layer. So, uh, what are the solutions that I would suggest uh, to solve these problems? Well, for the tracing API, I think open tracing is uh, the project that's really trying to move API standardization forward. So what we do there is we have an API that, if you look at the API in detail, you notice uh, it really goes out of its way to avoid exposing certain kinds of decisions that you would want to make. For example, it doesn't expose what kind of wire protocol you're using because there's a variety of wire protocols out there. We might have a standard one in the future, but we don't right now. So the API says when you inject 
some kind of uh, trace context uh, into your HTTP headers. Uh, there's nothing externally uh, visible as part of that API that describes what HTTP header you're going to put it into. Uh, but we would like to have a standard wire protocol. Uh, that work's currently be being done in a W3C group called the Trace Context Working Group. Uh, and we're starting with HTTP headers there, but you could imagine uh, other standards for other kinds of message queues and things coming out of that. I would love to see a sort of standard data format that doesn't exist yet at all, but this same W3C group is starting to kind of dig into that problem. Uh, and then analysis systems, who cares? So this is just that same graph again, uh, showing this thing from uh, kind of uh, with uh, these solutions baked in and where I think they need to be. So you would need open tracing inside of your service as the API that you're using and the API that your shared libraries are using. Um, you would need this standardized trace context in order to propagate that trace state to somebody else's service. Um, that service can kind of pump information out in whatever data format it wants, but as soon as you want to pull that back in uh, to your tracing system, uh, some kind of standardized trace data format, that's the place where you'd want to see that. So. And then uh, uh, normally when I give this talk, I do a demo at this point, but rather than doing that, uh, I want to turn this now into a QA. and a So that was a big rush through the landscape. Uh, so uh, I imagine there's a lot of questions. And I know also I've been talking about the general tracing world, but this is kind of an open tracing focus deep dive. Uh, but feel free to ask questions about some of this W3C stuff as well if you have a question on that front. And with that, Ah, uh, so there's, oh, right, sorry. So the question is, um, what about asynchronous workflows? How do you trace asynchronous workflows? And uh, there, there's two kinds of asynchronous workflows. One is very short-lived asynchronous workflows, uh, or what you might call asynchronous pro programming, where you're doing some kind of non-blocking I.O. Um, in tracing, here, let's see which slide that I have that best shows this. If you go back to here, uh, the same way you have these uh, parent-child relationships, uh, when you make that reference, uh, there's a couple kinds of references you can use. The primary one is called a child of uh, relationship that says the this child operation uh, is going to return to the parent operation. So there's uh, some work it was doing was on behalf of the parent operation. And then there's another reference type called follows from. And the follows from reference says, hey, I just kicked off this work, but I'm not waiting around for it to finish. So I just did some stuff and then go send an email in the background and then that's done. So you can uh, use those reference types to actually uh, collect all of that into a single uh, graph. Where this becomes problematic are very long running asynchronous flows. And I think that might be what you're, you're asking about. Yeah. Can I uh, jump on it? So let me just repeat the question. Uh, what about something that's very long running? So you have some like scheduled cron job that happens monthly. Uh, another example I would give is like rather than uh, a checkout, like where I'm like, boop, I'm going to purchase this item. What about the whole shopping cart experience where you're browsing around and picking things and you want to see all of that in a single graph? Yeah, I was just going to say the, uh, the challenge of tracing in general it's being met kind of in order of greatest need. And I think that tracing latency sensitive workloads has been such a priority that the sort of thing you're describing has been getting short shrift. Uh, that's my honest opinion. The, there's two questions really. There's modeling the type of transaction you're describing and there's a problem there. And then actually using tools that were designed to 
analyze and visualize those transactions. I'm unaware of a system that's out there right now that you can use that works well for transactions that take like 100 milliseconds and transactions that take multiple days. I've, there's this guy, Demetrios, who's involved with open tracing, who works at um, Bloomberg. Bloomberg, and they have some workloads like the ones you're describing, where they do a lot of computation over the course of many hours. There's also some people at, oh shoot, uh, Grail. It's like a, they're trying to cure cancer or some other insignificant task like that, but they're doing analysis of, of, of human genomes. It's this intensely complicated multi-hour map produce. And it, similarly, like they have these traces they want to generate, and they had to write their own analytical tools. The thing that, that I do like about the open tracing uh, approach to this is that Ted is correct in that we have like a follows from relationship, but we also have the idea of multiple parents. Because the other thing that comes up in asynchronous workloads, you often have forks and joins in the data. And if you have m many different pieces of data that are all collating into one joined thing, you can model that well in open tracing. The irony is that you can go and use any open tracing off the shelf thing, and none of them properly visualize that, you know? Um, and so I, I think there's a question of how you model it in the code. I think open tracing actually does that quite well. Unfortunately, I can't tell you. And then you should use this tool that binds to open tracing to analyze the data. The only thing I can tell you is what I told the people at Grail, which is what they're doing already, which is to write your own system <laughs> to visualize the thing. Hopefully you open source it and then other people can use it as well because I think the task of analyzing long running MapReduce jobs and things like that, it's a different problem, even if the, the instrumentation is the same. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful, but Thank you very much. yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah. And um, at the moment, we are using something like a uh, header and HTTP header that's called X tracing ID, for example. And we are passing this uh, through Aldo on distributed systems. And the question is again, it's, it's an easy question how can you convince me, no, throw this stack away, for example, use Jaeger or something like that? Well, uh, first, uh, so first, the question is if you're, if you're doing um, distributed logging. Right. Let's say you're like, I'm not calling it tracing. I'm just logging because I'm using a logging system. Maybe, maybe just a small introduction. Maybe sure. you can explain a little bit what do you mean by tracing exactly if it's not only about logging? Then what is it also about? Ah, so the question is if tracing isn't just about logging, you know, what is it about? Uh, and I would say my own personal opinion, and this is weirdly contentious, is tracing is just logging. Uh, tracing is logging in a world where you need some kind of index like this uh, X trace ID header that you're propagating uh, in order to get your logs into a logging system that's then indexing them based on that header so that you can look them up again later, right? So you're tracing. Right now you're tracing. Uh, and where I would say open tracing comes into play is right now you're probably having to write you know, some glue code yourself to actually shove that header, uh, you know, that request ID both in and out of your HTTP headers, and then you have this sort of pass the baton where like through your code, you need to somehow keep track of that ID somewhere, somehow. Uh, and just doing that sort of in-house on your own, you end up writing some code to deal with that, and all open tracing is is a sort of standardized way of doing that. So rather than having to do uh, all of that yourself or come up with those solutions, you could use the open tracing API uh, because basically you could take your system, start writing open tracing code, and have that uh, take exactly what you're doing as the back end for open tracing. No, no disagreement. No, uh, disagree. Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, I would say that not all tracing is logging, or sorry, there, there's, there's some distinctions here. Tra tracing typically has. Um, uh, some notion of causal information as well, so you know which log line caused which log line, if that makes sense. That's these references, which are usually not in a in a distributed logging system, and that's pretty important in that if you have a, a transaction in a microservices architecture, it will typically involve a lot of concurrency, and so if you just have a correlation ID in the log, it's really difficult to figure out 
Um, if you just chronologically order all the statements, it's hard to figure out which ones are actually on the critical path of the transaction, which is the thing that's holding up the end user. And a tracing system, because it has the information about what caused what, will allow you to focus just on the part of the system that's actually slowing down the end user. So the causal information is, is important. You could certainly put that in your logs as well, but then you'd have to go and, and reconstruct the story yourself. The other thing, tracing systems typically involve some form of sampling. The amount of data that's generated at scale by um, a detailed logging system is uh, sometimes a little overwhelming, uh, at least from an ROI standpoint. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say uh, is uh, uh, related uh, yeah, related to this why would you migrate. Um, if you're not going to write any more code, you probably shouldn't, seriously. Um, but, and, and so I think... So what's the what's the best way to migrate if you're going to migrate that sort of thing? No, the no. question is why should I use the open trace instead of this one? Assuming that there is no open trace. Instead of what you're doing already, you mean? Yeah. I, I think Ted sort of spoke to that, but I, it's just an, the advantage of using open tracing is that there's like hundreds of projects that already support it. And so if your developers depend on those projects, they don't need to instrument those by hand. That's it. And honestly, that, that may not be enough of a value proposition. Maybe you, you shouldn't. I'm serious. But, but if, if it's beneficial to have that integration there already, that's great. And then also, if down the line you decide to send the data somewhere else or to multiple places, it's a nice multiplexer. And you know, like depending on how you factored your code, you might have already accomplished that. And I'm not suggesting you didn't. But if, if, that's, a, if that's an advantage, that, that might yeah. be compelling as well. But it's OK to, you know, I'm not, I don't think open tracing should be used by everyone for all things. I think it makes sense if you're trying to decouple your instrumentation from where it gets sent. Um, and for Greenfield stuff, I think it makes a ton of sense. But if you already have a correlation ID and you're not planning on adding a lot more to the application in the future and it's just in maintenance mode, it really might not be worth it. It wasn't a rhetorical question. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's reasonable yeah. to keep it where it is if you're not going to add a lot of code to it. So. Yeah. And I want to just, just add a, two little writers onto that. One is, uh, uh, just to put it in concrete terms, you have one ID, which is the trace ID. So you have X trace ID. Uh, if you wanted to turn this more into tracing, you would be adding an additional ID that would be you know, X span ID, right? And that span ID would be the thing that would be changing with each operation, uh, along with a reference type you know, to say, so that you can figure out this is one stack, and this is another stack trace, and this is another stack trace. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, you were saying, for my application code, why should I change? I'm using Kibana, and it's fine. But if you take some part of that application code and turn it into a library, and you want to hand it to somebody else, and when they plug it into their system, uh, it automatically binds to any kind of monitoring they might be running, then you can't just put Kibana directly into there, right? Uh, because you'd be making a decision that your library only uses Kibana. And rather than saying that, you'd like to say, hey, my library just emits event data. Uh, it will, uh, if it's a RPC library, it will inject and extract these correlation IDs, whether it's Xtrace ID or something else, it doesn't matter. Um, and then other people can use it. So if they're not using Kibana or using that particular header, uh, they can still use your library without having to write that code all over again. Yeah. Any more questions? There's one back there. How do you handle time? Sorry? How do you handle time? How do we handle time? Uh, you mean like clock skew and things of that nature? Yeah. So open tracing as an instrumentation project gets to avoid this issue because the instrumentation is the same. You say, I'm starting this, I'm stopping this. The implementation has a real pickle on its hands. I mean, I know from our work at Lightstep, it's one thing on the server side, but when you do tracing across mobile clients where those clocks are off by a couple of seconds and the network latency is so high you can't run something like NTP, it's pretty painful. The one nice thing about tracing is that you do have some <laughs> 
well-defined ordering events. So you know that if you have a child of relationship, here what Ted was saying earlier, you can use the, the invariance expressed in the data model to say that the child's start time has to be after the parent's start time and the child's finish time has to be before the parent's finish time. And if you apply those across the trace, you can start to line up timestamps. But I don't know of a very satisfying answer. Uh, the Spanner paper goes into some detail about trying to reify uncertainty in clocks and blah, 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 blah. And, and I mean, at some point, it all just falls apart, though. If your clocks, if your network latencies are too large, there's really, I don't know of a, of a really satisfying answer to the time synchronization yeah. problem for tracing implementations. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so the Lamport clock type of, type of uh, approach is, is the, the kind of thing I was getting at with exp uh, ex uh, What's the word? Not exposing. Um, exploiting the inv invariance in the data model. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's a really pernicious problem. It's a good question. But but uh, yeah, and then just to reemphasize, one reason why it, it doesn't matter as much is you're not using uh, time or clocks to order these you know trace events. Uh, you're using a, a graph, so you're connecting them into a graph. So even if the clocks are skewing, you still know what led to what led to what uh, because the time doesn't matter. And then when, if you're doing latency analysis, assuming your clock isn't skewing between when you started the span locally and ending it, which does sometimes happen, but it's very rare, but assuming that your clock internally within each process is somewhat accurate, you can still get that latency information out for each span, uh, even if the clocks are skewed across, uh, across your client and your server. Yeah. There's a question there. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, how, how are errors and exceptions uh, handled uh, in open tracing and tracing? Uh, and uh, I would say the answer there is, is tagging. So on each span, uh, you can set tags. Uh, and some of those tags are used for indexing. Other tags are used to add like semantic information to your span. And the most common one is called the error tag. So there's a set of error values. And there's also, yeah, there's sort of the span can be in an error state which is well defined is also the specification has a particular way of representing um, exceptions and stack traces and things like that uh, in the in the there, each span has a list of time stamped events which are called logs which may be confusing sorry uh, but there's yeah this is the span level error and then below there's another specification for for the like yes. stack trace type information right so here's an example of like what we're trying to say is if you have an error uh, here are some, some standard tag names uh, so that when you're looking in these tracing systems, they're, they're expecting uh, these, these particular identifiers to be there. So if you see a tag that's named error and it's a Boolean value, that system knows that means this, uh, this span had a logical error. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So the question is, is, is the open tracing project also uh, involved in storage or any kind of back-end solution? And so I would say very emphatically, no. The, the purpose of the project is to have an abstracted API that makes no decisions about what you might do with the data. It doesn't make any decisions about where you would put it, uh, how you would export it. Uh, and that's very intentional uh, to allow you to, to pick your own back-end. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the talk I gave on whatever it was, the first day of this conference, uh, what was that? Wednesday. Wednesday. I have no idea what, 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 I don't, what year is it. Is it 2017? <laughs> anyway, the talk I gave the other day was um, uh, about this topic and the scope of the project, but I can say with some confidence, Open Tracing will never build like an analytical like tool that would store the data because we think it's really important to keep the project scope as narrow as possible. Yeah, the, the big ask that we're asking for in open tracing, if you get involved, is uh, to consider as the APIs stabilize, if you're making open source libraries, rather than having people include the, uh, the open tracing API calls as a plugin, you just bake it directly into the library. So Couchbase, for example, is a, a database, and their Java uh, SDK now comes with open tracing baked in. And along with that, they've also shipped a playbook uh, 
So they're like, here's all the event data that comes out of our client. Here's what it means. So if you're seeing like retries or timeouts, or if you see you know this event point, this is what you should do. This is how you should tune this thing. Uh, so that that's actually the main focus of the project is to enable that because that's the thing. If you go write these libraries right now, that's like really hard to give people that. You end up having to come up with some made up event thing and some hooks for them to figure out how they're going to put it into their system. I think we only have time for one more question. Yeah, I think we're at the end, right? Uh, okay, one last one. I've had some conversations with some of the people in the Lambda team, and there's some implementation concerns with doing tracing in an environment where you aren't allowed to retain state from call to call, so you have to flush with every single call, um, which are kind of annoying, but there's nothing profoundly difficult about it. The open tracing piece is not so bad. It's actually the implementation of the tracing system. X-Ray is probably the only thing that has a good shot at it in Lambda, because they can cheat. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I've asked them with my you know nicest, most polite voice to please, please, please expose hooks to make that kind of thing easier to implement efficiently, and I don't believe it's happened yet. I think the open source serverless frameworks hopefully will be more forthcoming about that. Yeah. So. And I think we're out of time. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, as a community, we all hang out on Gitter. Uh, and uh, so uh, you can come find us at gitter.im slash open tracing. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you there. Have a good yeah. one. Or ask questions after this. Thank you. <laughs>